May we read from the book of Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1. We'll read from verse 4 to verse 19. And the word of Jehovah came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the valley, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I hallowed thee. I appointed thee a prophet unto the nations. And I said, Alas, Lord Jehovah, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But Jehovah said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to whomsoever I shall send thee. And whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of them, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith Jehovah. And Jehovah put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And Jehovah said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdom, to pluck up and to break down, and to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. And the word of Jehovah came to me, saying, Jeremiah, what seest thou? And I said, I see a rod of an almond tree. And Jehovah said unto me, Thou hast well seen, for I am watchful over my word to perform it. And the word of Jehovah came to me the second time, saying, What seest thou? And I said, I see a seething pot, hot, and its face is from the north. And Jehovah said unto me, Out of the north, shall evil break forth upon all the inhabitants of the land. For behold, I am calling all the families of the kingdoms of the north, said Jehovah, and they shall come, and they shall set every one his throne at the entering of the gates of Jerusalem, and against all the walls thereof round about, and against all the cities of Judah. And I will pronounce my judgments against them for all their wickedness, in that they have forsaken me, and have burned incense unto other gods, and worship the works of their own hands. Thou therefore gird up thy loins, and arise, and speak unto them all that I shall command thee. Be not dismayed at them, lest I cause thee to be dismayed before them. And I, behold, I appoint thee this day as a strong city, and an iron pillar, and brazen walls, against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, against his princes, against his priests, and against the people of the land. And they shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee. For I am with thee, said Jehovah, to deliver thee. Jeremiah prophesied about or around 600 years before Christ. He prophesied at the closing period of the nation of Judah. God in his mercy at the very last moment as it were raised up a good king. A very good king. In the person of Josiah. The Bible says Josiah sought the Lord the God of his father David. And he walked according to the will of the Lord without turning to the right or to the left. Josiah was the grandson of that most notorious king, Manasseh. And he was the son of another wicked king, Amos. And yet in God's great mercy, God raised up this young lad. When he ascended to the throne of Judah, he was only eight years old. But in his eighth year, that is when he was sixteen, or fifteen or sixteen, he began to seek the Lord with all his heart. And in his twelfth year, when he was twenty, he began to purge the land 
of all the abominations of the idols in the land of Judah. And in his 20th year, 18th year, he cleansed the temple and found the book of the law. Amazing. A lad of eight years old with such wicked background. And yet, in God's mercy, when he was only in his teens, he began to seek the Lord with all his heart. And through him, a great reform came to the nation of Judah. At the same time, God laid his hand upon another young man. And that young man's name was Jeremiah. Jeremiah began to prophesy in the 13th year of King Josiah. That is to say, just one year after he began to cleanse the land of abominations. In God's ordering, God raised up a young man as the king. And by his authority, he began to reform, a religious reform in the land. The king was able to give command. The king was able to bring in a reform by his authority. The king was able to cleanse the land of idols. And the people followed the king. But that was all that the king was able to do. He couldn't reach the heart of the people. So at the same time, God raised up another young man, probably in his early twenties. With a vision and revelation he received from the Lord, he was able to penetrate, to probe into the very hearts of the children of Israel, of the children of Judah. Both the king and the priest and the people, he was calling the people to return in sincerity. The reform at that time was very real. So far as the king was concerned, it was from his heart. But the people only followed outwardly. Their hearts were so hardened that even though outwardly everything was cleansed, and inwardly they still remain hardened against the Lord. So God raised up this young man to do the inward work. To call the people to a heart return to God. Otherwise, the dome the nation was done. Unfortunately, even after his long years of faithful prophesying, you know, Jeremiah prophesied when he was probably in his early twenties. And he prophesied for a long period, about fifty years. He died an old man. And we were told by tradition that he was stoned to death by his own people, because they did not want to listen to his prophecy. After long years of prophesying, the people were not even. The faithfulness of King Josiah was only able to, for himself to be spared, of seeing the end of the nation. God could burn his judgment over the nation. God took Josiah away that he would not see it with his own eyes. But even his reform 
could not save that nation from destruction. Brothers and sisters, there is a great lesson for us today. God is looking for something that is real from the heart. He is not satisfied with anything that is just appearance. By the authority of the king, a reform might be brought in, but it was only outwardly true. God was looking for that which is real in the heart. And unless our heart, unless our heart turn back to the Lord, Judgment is inevitable. The very name Jeremiah means God is exalted. In other words, the Lord is exalted. Now think of it. His very name means the Lord is exalted. His whole life is to exalt the Lord. When the name of the Lord was despised, rejected by the people, here was a man whose very name was the Lord is exalted. And it is very strange to find that in the book of Jeremiah, the name Jehovah is used about or over 700 times. He mentioned the name of the Lord all the time. And it wasn't a popular thing to do at that time. Because the people despised the Lord. And yet here was a man who stood against the tide. Who stood against the current of lifting the Lord. Not only mentioning his name, but his whole life is to exalt the Lord. Was it costly? It was very costly. It cost Jeremiah everything. It cost Jeremiah not only his popularity, but he was persecuted time and again because of this. The kings were against him. The priests were against him. The false prophets were against him. The people were against him. Everybody was against him. He was put into dungeon. He was put into prison. He was deprived of food. It cost him everything. And yet, by the grace of God, this young man, after he was called, he stood faithful to the Lord to the very end, and he died, an old man, a martyr for God. Dear brothers and sisters, God is looking for people who can stand against the tide, the current of this world. It is costly. It seems as if you are raised up to be against everything, against everybody. Just like in the book of Revelation, you'll find there is a name, the name Antipas. And we couldn't find in church history a, a man by the name of Antipas. So probably it can only be interpreted symbolically. Antipas means anti-everybody. Anti-everything. Now, of course, God does not want us in a natural way. You know, uh, many people in this world, naturally, they are against everybody. They are not happy with the world. They are not happy with society, they are not happy with authority, they are not happy uh, with everything, and they are just against anything and everything, uh, indiscriminately. Of course, this is not what it means. 
but the world as it is. When the whole world is turning against God, then those who follow the Lord seems to be ethical. It seems as if they are against everything and everybody. Why? Because they want to go on with the Lord. It is very costly. But, is he worthy? Is our Lord worthy of costing us everything? He certainly is. Naturally. By naturally, I mean, so far as Jeremiah's disposition was concerned. Now, if you read the book of Jeremiah, you will more or less see a picture of that man. So far as his makeup was concerned, Jeremiah was not a courageous person. He was not a person with a dynamic personality. He didn't have a strong will of his own. On the contrary, Jeremiah was a very soft and tender, sensitive, timid, sympathetic kind of people. And God called him, he said, I cannot speak. I'm but a youth, but a child. And when the pressure became so great, you remember in the book of Jeremiah, he went to the Lord and said, Lord, relieve me of my responsibility. I don't want to do such a job. I don't want to be against everybody. I, I, I like to be with everybody. He asked the Lord to relieve him of his responsibility. Oh, how he loved the nation of Judah. How he loved the people. He loved them very much. And yet, because of their stubbornness against the Lord, he had to proclaim judgment after judgment upon the people whom he loved. And he didn't like it. How he sighed for the people. How he wept for the people. We know Jeremiah as the weeping prophet. Not because he liked to weep, but because he couldn't help but weeping. He loved the people so much, they wouldn't listen to the word of the Lord. He had to proclaim judgment over them, and he wept for them. If it could be left to him, probably he would try to just shut his mouth. He didn't like to proclaim the judgment of the Lord. He didn't like to proclaim the judgment over the people whom he loved so much. He would rather shut his mouth and be popular and be sweet to everybody. But when he tried to shut his mouth, there was, as it were, a fire burning in his bones, and he just couldn't help it. Now, that was the kind of person Jeremiah was. It was the Lord who apprehended that man. And there was no escape for him. And by the grace of God, he was willing to cooperate. He was willing to obey against his own nature, as it were. Against his own disposition. Against his own desire. He was willing to yield to the Lord against his own self. And in that man, God found a mouthpiece, a prophet. Dear brothers and sisters, it is not our natural makeup. It is not our temperament. It is not what we are. God is able to use all kinds of dispositions. God is able to use all kinds of people. It does not depend upon us at all. It is up to the Lord. 
the thing is, in spite of what we are, are we willing to yield to the Lord even against our own self? And if so, then God is able to use us. However timid we may be. Or however brave we may be. It doesn't make any difference. The Lord is able. Now this morning, we would like to share a little bit on the call of Jeremiah. And his commission. The call of God came to Jeremiah. Before I formed thee in the valley, I knew thee. And before thou came forth out of the womb, I hallowed thee. I appointed thee a prophet unto the nations. You find in the call of Jeremiah, there are three things. Number one, God said, before I formed thee in the valley, I knew thee. The foreknowledge of God. Our calling depends on the foreknowledge of God. God is sovereign. Our calling does not depend upon us. Why? Because before we are formed in the valley of our mother's womb, God said, I knew you. Therefore, it cannot depend upon us because we we were not there. It is the foreknowledge of God. Our calling is traced way back to the foreknowledge of God. That's the reason why the Lord said, even before the foundation of the world. Even before the foundation of the world. Even before we are formed in the valley, even there is any any praise of us, God, in His foreknowledge, He knew us. Now that is wonderful. God is omniscient. He knows everything. Right now. With God, there is no past, there is no future. The knowledge of God is always present. He sees it all. Whatever is going to happen to him, it is already with him. That is his foreknowledge. Therefore, you remember in Psalm 139, when the psalmist, speaks of the full knowledge of God, of the wonderful knowledge and the power of God. In Psalm 139, he says, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully wonderfully made, marvelous all thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My bones were not hidden from thee when I was made in secret, curiously wrought in the lower parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my own form substance. And in thy book all my members were written, during many days were they fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. But how precious are thy thoughts unto me, O God, how great is the sum of them. The foreknowledge of God. Now, brothers and sisters, of course, we do not have that knowledge. We have hindsight, but not foresight. We have to wait until things happen, and then we look back and we begin to understand a little bit. But God has that foresight. He has that foreknowledge. According to his foreknowledge, he has predestinated us to be conformed to the image of his Son. As he has foreknown us, He has called us. So, brothers and sisters, let us be very thankful to the Lord that we are called. 
Not because we are better than anybody else. No worse. It doesn't depend on us at all. It is based on the full knowledge of God. And that's how we are called. And then the second point here in Jeremiah is, not only God said, before I formed thee in the valley, I knew thee, and before thou comest forth out of the womb, I hallowed thee. God not only foreknew, but God set us apart for himself, even before we are born. Do you know, brothers and sisters, that you have been set apart for what? For whom? For God. Even before you come out of your mother's womb. Yeah, we know that some people, before they are born, their parents offer them to the Lord, just like Samuel. Before Samuel was born, you remember Hannah? She made a vow that if God will give her a male son, a male child, then after he was born, he will be presented to the temple to serve God. But Samuel was not a special case. As a matter of fact, even if our parents had not presented us to God before we were born, God has already done it. Before we come out of our mother's womb, God has already set us apart, hallowed us. We have no right to live for ourselves. Because God has already set us apart for Him. He knew us. He hallowed us. Even before we are born, we are set apart. Just like Paul. You remember Paul said in First Timothy, how when he was in his mother's womb, God has set him apart. Now, of course, he didn't know that. For a number of years, he was ignorant of it. He was going on his own way. He was seeking after his own purpose. He thought he was doing a great work for God. Until God met him on the road of Damascus. And then it began to open up to him that actually, before he was born, God had already set him apart for God's purpose, not for his purpose. And that is comforting to know. 